Today we're going to talk about a very difficult subject. It pertains to the decree of God. That is, that God rendered certain all events. It can be a little confusing, but hang in there with me. We've been going through trying to understand what God is like, and we've looked at this. We've looked at the fact that, number one, uh, you know, God has an essence. He has some attributes. The attributes in here within the essence. And now a combination of the two, essence and attributes, make up what we would call the nature of God. Well, you'll notice under the nature of God, one of the key words that is found there is the word sovereign. God sovereign. God is chief. He is number one. He rules over all. And I think once we begin to understand that God is the one who is over all, the absolute controller of the universe, it kind of leads to this discussion concerning uh, God's decree. Now, what do I mean by God's decree? I mean basically this, God's plan. God's plan. What has God done? And it's obvious that what he has done is he has planned some things. He has decreed some things. Let me define it another way. He has rendered certain all things that have ever come about. Now understand this. He never decreed anything about himself. You have to understand that. In other words, everything we've been talking about God, you see, is eternal. I mean, God didn't sit around one day and say, look, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to plan to be holy. He didn't do this. He was always holy. As much as that blows our minds, He was always holy. He was always righteous. He was always all-knowing. But what God has done now is to come up with a plan, and the plan is not eternal. And He has decided to render certain, you see, all events. All events. Here's my conclusion. God planned for you to be here today. Did you know that? You say, man, I don't think so. I, I, in fact, I don't even think God knew that I was going to be here this morning. No, He knew it. He knew it. He's an omniscient God. In fact, with what He knows, He has put it all into His plan. He knew that you'd be here today, and He also rendered certain that you would be here today. And nothing takes Him by surprise. So, He's not sitting there and saying, oh, what do you know? They made it to class today. Now, the prof may be a little surprised that you're here, but not God. And so God has rendered certain everything that transpires in the universe, you see, is under, you know, his control, his direction, you know, his plan. Now, this gets a little difficult when we begin to think through the implications of all of this, but, but hang with me a little bit on this. And... And don't be afraid to ask some of the tough questions. But what I'd like to say is, is that, well, God planned for Hitler to kill six million Jews. That's what I want to say to you. Okay. So that's what I'm leading at. He has planned that. He has rendered it certain. Okay. You say, wow, that's too much to handle. Because frankly, I think that when it all transpired, God sat up there and he says, oh, oh no, look what's happening. If only I had known. Number one, did God know? Yeah. Yes, he's on mission. We know. That. Number two, could God have stopped it? He could have stopped it. He's an all-powerful God. Then why didn't he stop it? And my answer is, is that's what he wanted. Just the way he wanted it. All right. And in that sense, this is what I'm saying. He has rendered certain all events. Paul lived under a, a tyrant. His name wasn't Hitler. What was his name? Nero. Nero. And yet he wrote Romans, the 13th chapter. Let's look at Romans 13. And you can see that this didn't take God by surprise uh, either. So this is Romans 13, verse 1. Verse 1 says, Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. For there is no authority, and I think he's talking about past authorities now, 
No authority except that which, notice, God has established. Wow, that's pretty powerful, isn't it? Then he also goes on to say, the authorities that exist. Now, in contrast to the past authorities, the present officials, he goes on to say, they, you see, have been established by God. Wow. Wow. He says, I always thought that God just knew what was going to come about, and his hands were somewhat tied. He really didn't know what to do, and he would just say, well, I know about it, but... <sighs> But according to this verse, it appears that those that are in authority, whoever they are, whether past or whether present, you see, have been established by God. In other words, he's planned that way. All right? He has rendered it certain. All right? It's a tough one. This is a tough one to stop and think about. But everything is planned. And it's just the way God wants it. Well, let's keep thinking about this a little bit. My suggestion is he also planned sin. What do you think about that? He planned sin. You think so? <coughs> you mean it just happened? God said, oh, I didn't know it was going to come about. First of all, did God know it was going to come about? Could God have stopped it? Yes. He is sovereign. He can do whatever he wants. But the fact of the matter is he didn't stop it. Why didn't he stop it? Because he says that's the way he wanted. Wouldn't you guess that that's the way he wanted? And so he rendered it certain to take place before the foundation of the world. And he planned for Christ to die, yes or no? Well, I think so. Let's just look at a couple of verses, see if they help us a little bit. But Revelation, the 13th chapter. Look at verse 8. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast. All those whose names have not been recorded in the book of life belonging to the Lamb that was slain from where? From the creation of the world. Alright? Looks like before the world was ever created, what? In the mind of God, you see. Christ was crucified. Well, for him to plan salvation, wouldn't you say then that salvation is deliverance from what? Sin. It'd be ridiculous to plan salvation from sin if indeed, you say, nothing was ever planned about sin. Doesn't that seem to follow? So I'd say in that sense, he planned sin. Now, you say, oh, I'm really struggling with this. I... I don't know. I would be better, I, I think it'd be better to say, and this is probably what you're saying, just to say God knew about it. God knew about it. But not that he planned it. He knew about it. But my statement to you is this. Yes, he knew about it. He knew about it. But I think it is more than just he knew about it. I would say yes, he knew about it, but he also planned. In other words, he said, look, that's what I want rendered certain. Let's look at a couple of verses and see if they help us a little bit. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 23. This man now Speaking about Jesus, was handed over to you, notice, by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. Foreknowledge. Where foreknowledge means prearrangement. Prearrangement. So, this was a wicked crime that was committed when they killed the Messiah. Was that all planned? It seems to indicate here that this man was handed over, you see, for all these things on the basis of what? What God wanted. His prearrangement. You see, his, uh, his uh, purpose. His set uh, purpose. There's another verse. Acts chapter 4. 
Acts chapter 4. Verse 27, indeed, we read, Herod, Pontius Pilate, met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. Verse 28, they did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. So, the Father wasn't seated up in heaven and say, Oh, oh no, what are they going to do? You say. And I also think it was more than, well, he just knew what would happen. No, according to these verses, it appears that, hey, this is God's plan. This is what he had decided, you see, that would happen before it ever came about. It's a tough one, isn't it? It's a tough one. Because it leads to a lot of problems, and the problems are, look, if God, you see, came up with a plan and he has rendered it certain, and this is what he has decided beforehand should happen, I mean, why in the world does he do this? And I struggle with that. You know? Every time you read of a tragedy, you read of what? $5 billion worth of homes going up in flames, you see, in California. You read about people, you see, dying in the blaze. And you have to say, did God know this? Yes or no? Well, it's obvious He knows everything. Could He have stopped it? Could He have stopped it? I think so. God's an all-powerful God. Remember, He is able to do whatever He wills to do. You say, well, why didn't he stop it? I mean, why did the blaze go around some homes and not touch them and then engulf others? Huh? You say, well, there were believers in all of those other homes. Well, I'm not always sure that that's true. You listen to some TV programs and somebody will get on and say, all the houses went up except mine, and therefore, you know, you know, God, uh, God was good to me, but, uh, well, I don't know. You read a lot of places in the Bible where the righteous are sitting around saying, well, why did the heathen prosper and not the righteous? You know, So you get that dilemma. Well, well, why? Why? And, and I, I think I have to be honest with you and say this. Look, if it were me, if it were me, I wouldn't have come up with the plan that he had. Okay? Because frankly, there are a lot of things in the plan I don't understand. There are a lot of things in the plan I would change. You would too, wouldn't you? I mean, if you've had a tragedy, a, a tragedy in your own home or in your own life, or you have some own trials and difficulties, I mean, wouldn't you, if you were God, wouldn't you change all that? If you had a chance. See, I've looked at a lot of things and said, oh, you see, if I were God, I wouldn't do it. The only problem is, is what? I'm my God. And I don't know a whole lot. And I know He knows everything. And so I think I have to kind of come at it and say, look, Lord, I don't understand what you're trying to do, but I do know this. You're a good God. You're a righteous God. Your plan ultimately, in the end, you see, is going to bring you glory, and that's what it's all about. And right now, frankly, it looks like a scrambled mess to me. Okay? <clears throat> you see people do this, so what, needlework? Is that what they call it? Where the stitching on the one hand, on the one side, has a beautiful design. Have you ever turned it over and looked on the back side? It's a mess. And I would say often it looks like that from our perspective. We're looking up at it. God, you see, is looking down, you see, seeing the end from the beginning, seeing everything in light, you see, of his eternal perspective. And I think ultimately what happens is we just have to come and say, look, I trust you, God. I trust you. There are two problems here. We either come to the place in our lives where we say, look, I uh, I don't understand everything that happens. Or the other thing that transpires in our life is, is that what we try to do is make God somewhat human and limited and, and try to bring him down in the seat so that we can put him in a nice neat little box with no hands hanging out and say, now, I, I can finally understand why 
why God has done this. Frankly, God's limited. His hands are tied. You see the problem? I don't think his hands are tied. I think he's a sovereign God. Because he's sovereign, he's number one. He is chief. He can do whatever he wants. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6, we're in the tribulation period. It's a terrible time upon this earth. And when we come to verse 9, what we read is, is that some of the saints now are getting killed. Those that are getting killed cry out to the Lord and they say, Lord, look at verse 10. Sovereign Lord, you, you the one in absolute control of the universe. Their question is this, how long? How long, Lord, will it be before finally you avenge, you see, our blood in light of what has taken place? And what does the Lord say to him? The last part of that verse? Actually, this is verse 11. He says, hey, just hang in there. Just wait a little longer. All right? We've got to have some more killed first. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. It's not as if, as if God is sitting around and saying, oh, no, I don't know what they're doing. I wish the devil wasn't so powerful. Huh? He's saying, just relax. We've got to kill a few more, and then it'll be over. Okay? And the one who is saying that is the one who is in absolute control. It's difficult, isn't it? Difficult. But think about it. Did God know that the devil would rebel against him? Yes or no? No, I would think so if he knows everything. Could he have stopped from creating him? I think so. He's free. He's not bound, you see, to do whatever transpired. So, he could have refrained from creating him. Suppose now that the serpent now, as he's coming through this gar uh, garden, coming to Adam and Eve, could he have stopped that? Could he have stopped that? I think so. Do you think God could have stopped Satan from afflicting Job, yes or no? Yes. Well, let's turn to Job chapter 1. I want to show you a verse that may shock you. Job chapter 1. In Job chapter 1, verse 8, we read, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? Oh, look at that. It wasn't Satan who came to God and said, God, let me at Job. It wasn't that way at all. Who arranged for this? Oh, it was God. I mean, he set this situation up. He goes to the devil and says, Now look, why don't you try Job, huh? And I think Satan was sitting around and saying, Wow, I never even thought of asking. I figured you'd always say no. And God says, No, go for it. Now, doesn't that seem kind of strange for you? It seems kind of strange, but I mean, he was the author of this. Who's the author of all things that have ever come about? It's God. Who's the author of all circumstances? It's God. You say, no, wait a minute. You make it sound like God is totally responsible for this. Ah, ah get this. I want you to know that God has rendered certain all things. But here's a couple things. God never actively promotes evil. I want you to know that. And what's kind of interesting is, is God says, okay, have you considered my servant Job? And Satan says, ah, oh, you mean you're going to let me go after him? And God says, yes. But as soon as Satan does that, what happens? God then turns around to Satan and says, ah, but you wicked creature, you, all right, as a result of what you have done in tempting Job, you're going to the lake of fire. Huh? 
In other words, God is the author of circumstances. He's the author and the source of all things. He created, you see, the whole plan that came into existence. He could have stopped the plan from coming into existence, but in light of all of it, he doesn't take any of the responsibility, you see, for moral evil or sin. Let's go back to Acts chapter 2. All right, Acts chapter 2. Him being delivered now by what? The determinate counsel of God and foreknowledge. You see, he was given over to see to you. But read the last part of the verse. I didn't read that the first time we went through. What's it say? But you, with wicked hands, you see, you killed him. In other words, who gets the blame? The God doesn't sit around and say, oh, well, look, let me just take the blame for it. I'm the one who set it all up. I planned it. I had you walk right into the trap. I will take the responsibility. He never does this. He says, look, it's planned, but I want you to also know this. Look, hey, you're responsible. So you see two things in the plan. You see divine sovereignty. You also see human responsibility. And you might be sitting there and say, well, I just don't think that that's fair. And he arranged it, and then he doesn't take the responsibility. Yeah, I can understand some of the struggle. I struggle there sometimes myself. But I do want to say this. I see these two things in Scripture. Yes, God's planned it, but hey, you, with wicked hands, you say, kill me. You think any of you would get an F in this class? is a W. Huh. Is it possible? I want to tell you, whatever your grade will be, it was rendered certain before you ever came into class. Did you know that? It was rendered certain. Some of you say, oh, if that's the case, it is rendered certain, why should I stay? <laughs> All right? Because I'll get whatever is determined. But I think this is how it's going to all flush out at the end. God's going to say, look, I planned for you to get in that. But you didn't stay. All right? So there's the divine sovereignty. There's the human responsibility. God doesn't say, look, I'm going to take the blame for you. I'm going to have no response. Okay. You get the responsibility. All right? So this is a tough thing. Tough thing. Well, let's see what questions you have. Yeah. That's all right. Are you distinguishing between plan and cause? Plan and cause. Or allowing? Yeah, it depends on how we're going to use some of these words, okay? So, if you're saying, did God plan it? I, I still am content with saying he planned it. Now, what do you mean by cause? Do you mean plan or did you, do you mean he actively promotes the evil, you say? And so I'm trying to distinguish this. I'm saying there is a sense in which all things are planned, rendered certain. But, you see, in light of rendering certain all things, it doesn't mean that he actively promoted evil, you see, in the plan. Now, he may have arranged for certain circumstances leading up to it. Like he put Adam and Eve there. He put the tests there. He brought Satan into the picture. He said, now don't do this. And he undoubtedly told Satan uh, earlier, don't you rebel against me, which he did, you see. By this time, he had rebelled. God knew exactly what was going to take place. And I would say, in that case, he could have stopped it. He could have said, you know, I'm tired of this devil. All right? And took him right out of the picture. But the fact of the matter, he, he didn't do it. So he wrenched for the circumstances. Do you understand that? But at the same time, he doesn't say to Adam and Eve, well, look, hey, let me take part of the blame. All right? You see, it was really a nasty trick on my part because it's interesting he doesn't do that. So, you say, what about Hitler? Well, could he have killed Hitler when he was a kid by a cop? Huh? Or could, could, you know, God somehow afflicted him so that he would have been born, you know, so he would have never been capable of being a leader? And my answer is, is yes. 
But who, who's the problem for Hitler? I mean, who takes the blame for all of that? See, I would say it's Hitler. Hitler would never be able to stand before God and say, but God, I couldn't do anything else. I was in an environment, you see, where there was all kinds of pressure on me. Look, it seemed like a, the, the problem was the Jew, and look, all I did was just follow my own sinful nature. What will God say? Who's responsible for his own sinful nature? <clears throat> yeah, for you. With wicked hands. Killed those people, you see. You see, well, he really didn't have any choice in the matter. Well, that's interesting. Does anybody have the choice to be born without a sin nature? Yes or no? I'd say no. No. You say, this is just not fair. Well, I can understand your struggle. Is God fair? Yes or no? God's fair. God's fair. He always acts fair. I mean, we just seen this. It's one of the attributes of God. You see, He always acts just. Now, there are some people that, don't, that believe that God doesn't act fair. All right? And that's one of the reasons they reject Him. And they say, hey, if you believe a God like this, hey, forget it. Forget it. There are just too many problems. An article in the paper here at Willamette University, I think, was just saying that, wasn't it? Look, if this is the kind of God that we actually have to live with, here are the problems. Therefore, I'm not so sure I'm willing to bow the knee. So it makes it very, very difficult. You have a question. Well, let's look at another verse. Luke 22, verse 22, and then I'll come and get your question. Okay? Luke 22, verse 22. Kind of the same thing. We see it actually over and over again in Scripture. Okay? Luke 22, verse 22. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed. Uh-huh. It was all planned that he would go and die. But, oh, look what it says. The woe to that man who betrays him. You see two things there? I see two things. I see divine sovereignty. Everything is planned. I also see human responsibility. And God says, okay, Judas, you betray the Lord, you're in deep, deep trouble. Okay? So. Probably Judas wouldn't betray him had Jesus never been there, right? Judas wouldn't have betrayed him had he never been picked. You know? But you see, even though this was all planned, in the end, God didn't say, oh, let me just take the responsibility. I'm sorry, I did this. I did this evil, wrong, deep. No. He blames, you see, the one where the responsibility comes. That's a tough one. That's a tough one. Yeah. You were talking about in Job, discussing Job. Yeah. In one chapter, talking about God calling against Job. It wasn't the period he always seen his choice. Part of it was God actually calling him Job. So isn't that demonstrating God being part of him? Well, I don't know. It's kind of interesting. It may look like God's part of the problem. But it's interesting. As you go through Scripture, I don't see any place where God says, look, hey, I'll concede I'm part of the problem. I, I don't ever see him taking the blame. Do you know what I'm saying? He'll take the glory, but not the blame. So, let's look at it this way. You have a trial in your life. A trial in your life. Tragedy in your life. Who's, the resp who's responsible for bringing about that, that trial? Well, there might be a sense in which you could say both. You see? Both God and Satan. You see, God may be working it, you see, to bring out his ultimate glory. I think this is what he was trying to do with Job. But you see, working out the details of this plan, you have Satan, who's very evil who's bringing this about. So there's a sense maybe both could be involved. God's working his end, but he is not taking responsibility for, you know, any evil that transpires in this. 
So I just wonder how many of our trials have come about. You, you could put it this way. Satan is responsible for it, but at the same time, God allows it. God allows it. Okay? But what I'm trying to say is, even when God allows it, He allows it on the basis of what? His plan. Rendering it certain. That's what I'm trying to say. Let's, let me try to explain some other things. See if this, this happens. Because you might be saying, well, boy, this leads to fatalism, really, if you hold this view. You know, that everything is planned. I mean, why, why do anything? Oh, well, understand this. As part of God's plan, God doesn't only plan the end. He also plans the means, too. All right? So they're both there. So if the end is you're going to pass this class, he's also going to plan what? That you're going to stay. So, you know, both are there. So that all has to be thrown, you know, into this, uh, into this picture. And I guess the other thing that we have to remember is, is that some of you will refuse to stay. And so it is not as if God is just sitting there and saying, well, look, I'm going to keep them from studying. No. He's just going to allow you, you see, to exercise your freedom in this particular area. But again, even though he allows it, that's all part of his plan. So, I don't know, this might be a little confusing, but I would say he plans... You see all things, and in that plan, some things are determined, some things are allowed. You have to understand that. Okay? Yeah. Um, this is a clarification. You said you differentiated between allowing and actually doing it. Um, I, I believe that it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And, and that might just be a difference in, in, in definition, but um, does that mean that he did it or that he allowed it? No, I would say in uh, Pharaoh's heart, and we want to come back to that because I do want to talk about what I call the unpardonable sin. Okay? But I would say, I don't have any problem in saying, no, he hardened uh, Pharaoh's heart. Okay? Now, I think there are other ramifications to it. I, re I think the reason he brought about this hardness and this blindness is because there was continual and perpetual, you see, unbelief on the part of Pharaoh. So... Uh, I think there's some other uh, ramifications to the whole thing, but I think God made it possible whereby he had gone so far, there was no way that he could ever get back. And so God just made him, made him hard. All right? So, uh, so there's some ramifications in that one, yes. Well, if he was already to the point where he could never go back, wasn't he already hard? Wasn't he hardened prior to that time? Well, you said he got to a point where he could never go back, but yeah. God hardened him. Once he was to the point where he could never go back, wasn't he already hardened? I mean, wasn't the hardening process of those, those steps? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And maybe what you could say in response to what God did in hardening his heart is, is that he just made it more difficult for him. So that there was, you know, it was inconceivable, you know, that he would ever do, you know, any good. But there, there could be a progression, you see, of the hardening process there. Yes. Well, um, I, mean, I was just thinking, when Pharaoh, when God heard him heart, his heart, it was after he already said he could go. So wouldn't, could that be kind of like his human, the, the human heart, just his natural compassion and frustration with all these things that were being set upon him? And then, you know, like he'd have to go back and confuse about what happened when he got the heart. So would it be like his natural? Yeah. Well, the question is, is exactly how does he do this? How does he do it? Now, remember yesterday we were in Isaiah, the sixth chapter, and he said, you know, uh, you go and preach these people. Actually, uh, he was preparing Isaiah in the passage we looked at yesterday. If you continue to read for that, God says, okay, I've got, I've got a ministry for you to accomplish. Will you do this? Will you do this? And do you remember uh, the question came, who will go for us? And Isaiah says, hey, I'll go. Do you remember that? Well, what did God tell him to do? Have you ever read that in Isaiah chapter 6? He said, you go out and you preach. And here's the thing, as you go out and preach, you know what's going to happen? You're going to preach and the people are going to get mad at what you say and they're going to reject you. And the more you preach, 
the more they reject until they get so hard they'll never be converted. Isn't that interesting? So in that sense, you could say God hardened their hearts. How did he do that? Well, he did it in a process. He did it, you see, through an instrument, going out, you see, and preaching a message that they had refused at the beginning, but he said, keep preaching it, because the more you preach it, the worse it's going to get. And it'll get so bad, these people get so hard, get so callous, there's no way back. Okay, so. That's why when I've preached at a church, I've come to this conclusion. Sometimes, as I have preached, I think I have made people's lives more miserable than had they never come to church. Do you understand that? Had they never come to church, they wouldn't have thought much about the whole thing. But the fact that they're sitting out there in the third row every week and listening to the preacher, and the preacher keeps saying, look, you repent of your sin. And you say, look, I hate that preacher, you know? <laughs> hey, he just gets more hardened than the guy who's down there on the street. So, so in that sense, you can say, look, hey, God hardened you see, for all's heart. But I want to come back to that because it is what I call the unpardonable sin, and I want to talk about that later. What's up? Use a couple of illustrations and see if this helps us in. I remember hearing the story one time of a guy who went to church and he basically heard what I've been telling you today. And that is, look, God has rendered all things uh, certain. So after the church service, he said, well, I'm just going to get into my cart and let the horse, you know, just take the cart home and I'm not going to try to do anything to guide the horse. And the horse took off and went like crazy, went around the corner too fast, and what happened is the cart and the horse and the guy all ended up in the ditch. Another guy came up and he said, no, why? Why are you over here in the ditch? He said, look, I heard this, this sermon on the decree of God tonight in church. And I came to this conclusion, look, if everything is rendered certain, then why worry about anything? Whatever will be, will be. And the guy looked at him and he says, aha, he says, uh, I see that, uh, uh, oh, I forgot the line. Here. I see that, uh, that, <laughs> No, oh, I, I already remember that. He says, I, I perceive now that you were predestined, predestined to be a fool. All right? And now you are making your calling and election sure. All right? Now that, now that says something about what I'm trying to say here. If you refuse to study, I want to tell you something. You're going to find out God's plan for you to be a fool. Okay? So, remember this. He does take means in as well as the end. So it's not God just arbitrarily sitting in heaven, you see, working a plan in which fatalism ought to grip our heart. No, that's not the idea. Human responsibility, you see, is part of the plan. Let me give you another one. I had a brother-in-law who once told me that uh, he felt like the Lord kind of tugging on his heart and saying, look, you need to go and talk to this fellow about the Lord. And he decided he wouldn't go. So he didn't. Oh, the Lord kept working on him, and one day he decided to get over there a couple weeks later, and as he went to the door, this woman's husband opened the door, and he said, I'd like to talk to your husband. And she said, I'm sorry, he's not here. He died a week ago. Now, think about this. God, I believe, wanted him to go and witness to this guy. Because part of God's plan is God wanted him to be saved. All right? He has refused to go. What happened now? What happened to the plan? Is the guy unsaved? Huh? Well, let me say this. If God chooses people to be saved, they'll get saved. Whether you go or not. All right? I believe that. In other words, he's going to, you know, plan the ends. He's also going to plan the means. 
This woman then said to my brother-in-law, she said, you know, but though he passed away, I'm very sad about that, you know, two days before he died, do you know that the Southern Baptist pastor in town came over to visit him and led him to the Lord? And I, I think what I learned in all of this is basically this. Look, hey, if the regular Baptists don't do it, the conservative Baptists will do it. And if the conservative Baptists don't do it, the Southern Baptists will do it. And if the Southern Baptists don't do it, the Alliance will do it. And if the Alliance don't do it, do you know what I'm trying to say? And look, every group has their whole group of shirkers, you know? He's got 40. I don't think he's 40. You know? Good to see some other meat. If that's what God wants, you see, as an end, you see, he'll plan the means. The only thing my brother-in-law missed out on was what? The blessing of God and be able to participate in what God is doing in the lives of people. And to some degree, maybe all of us do that, but I don't think we frustrate God. You're sitting up here and saying, well, I'm never going to talk to anybody about the Lord. Hey, fine. You know, God's not sitting up in heaven and saying, oh, no, what am I going to do? My whole program, you see, is based upon what those kids at Western Baptist College will do. I want to tell you something. He'll use the kids at home. <laughs> you ought to be able to do it better than they up there, but he'll use them. And I don't think you see God thwarted in the process. And so, you know, that's how he kind of works his plan. But it's a tough one. It's a tough one. And I don't know that I have all the answers. Because ultimately, when you ask me, why does God allow this family to have such tragedy? Why? And all I can know is this, look. Hey, I think the devil's at work. He's going to take the blame for a lot of this. I do know this. God knew all about it from the beginning. And whatever God is doing, he's working to see for his ultimate glory. And right now, to me, it looks like a mess. But I do, do know this. He is worthy, he said, to be worshipped. It basically comes down to this. If God couldn't have stopped Hitler from killing six million Jews, if he couldn't have stopped it, then my question is this. What kind of a weak God do we worship? You say he's not weak, he's powerful. Then he could have stopped it. You say, well, why didn't he? I say... He's sovereign. He can do whatever he wants. Remember hearing these elephant jokes about where can an elephant sit? Huh? What's the answer to that? He can sit wherever he wants. All right? I sort of feel like that with God. He can do whatever he wants. He's sovereign. And who are we anyhow? us little hipsqueaks to reply against God and say, God, why are you doing it this way? Just who do you think you are anyhow? You know, Paul asked that question, remember? In Romans the ninth chapter? And I think we have to say you're right. You're right. We're not. Frankly, all we are are little rebels who have rebelled against God. But apart from God's grace, He changed our lives and made us look at things differently. Can I solve all your problems? I can't solve all your problems. But I'll tell you this, God's a good God. God will always act right. And when somebody comes in, I talked to a father just last night on the phone with his heart just being poured out with respect to what has happened, you see, to his kids. A godly man. And I look at this and I say, oh Lord, why? Why this family? You know? 
Or I have somebody in my church and all of a sudden their kid's life is snuffed out. You know, in a freak accident. I ask, why? Now I live across the street from a kid that, you know, I have to look at it and say, you know, if his life was snuffed out, I don't think anybody would miss it. You know? You say, how do you harmonize it? I don't know that I harmonize it, but I'll tell you this. We don't have a weak God. He could have stopped it. Why doesn't he stop it? Because that's the way he wants it. And I say, in that sense, you see, he has rendered certain all things. Be careful, though, now. When you go out and say to people, look, God's planned all things. Just make sure that God doesn't get blank. All right? Even though, ultimately, he could have come up with a different plan. I think he could have come up with maybe ten different plans. Maybe more. He happened to come up with this one. Frankly, it wouldn't have been my choice of a plan. But, what do I know anyhow? Huh? It's one of these things where we're sort of humble. Humble by what we read in Scripture and we recognize love. Hey, God said purpose has brought this about. I don't know, you see, all the implications of it. This will lead me now to this discussion. Okay? Has God planned for me to be at Western Baptist this semester? And my answer is yes. Has God planned who you are going to marry? My answer has to be, it will probably take him by surprise. Is that true? <laughs> no. So. If God has rendered certain who I'm going to marry, then, here's the question, can I know when I am in the center? of God's will. So that's where it's going to lead us. And we'll talk about that for the next couple of days. I'll see you tomorrow.